um, to be on the other side of these seminars and have a chance uh, to talk to you all about some of my research. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you today about work that was done as part of the Ethicobots uh, Consortium. So this is uh, work that has had many, many people contributing to it. This was a very large um, project funded mostly by um, international development money from the UK, actually, but involving essential partner institutions and Ethicobots, principally for this work. Um, Addis Ababa University and um, the Veterinary uh, National Veterinary Laboratory, formerly uh, known as NADIC, um, but also uh, the Animal Plant Health Agency here in the UK, along with um, other collaborators in UCL and in Cambridge. So the purpose of this um, project was to help to build the evidence base to advise the Ethiopian government on not only the scale of the problem that they have with bovine tuberculosis in their herds, but also what might be done and what the potential costs and benefits might be of introducing controls um, for this important economic disease um, of cattle. So as a mathematical modeler, my job, it shouldn't surprise you, um, was to start building those models to try and understand what those costs and benefits are different potential controls might be. Before we can do that, though, the first thing we need to do is understand what is the basic epidemiology um, of this disease. And in terms of prediction, we need to understand what the rates of transmission are. And it turns out this is actually an incredibly challenging problem with bovine tuberculosis, because most of the standard methods that we could use for a nice, easy disease like SARS-CoV-2, perhaps, um, just don't work. For bovine TB. So we need to take different strategies and need to use um, a number of different strategies, as it turns out, to try and understand what the range of plausible um, uh, transmission rates might be. So I want to start by just introducing you to what bovine tuberculosis is and why it is such a challenging disease, um, both to model and to control. Um, ultimately. So it's a very promiscuous organism. Um, so bovine uh, tuberculosis is caused by infection by members of the mycobacterium tuberculosis complex. Um, the host range for this complex ranges pretty much across anything that's warm-blooded. So pretty much any mammal can potentially get infected with um, tuberculosis. It is a chronic, progressive and debilitating disease. Although um, when we think of TB, we probably first think of pulmonary disease as that's the sort of most um, common, certainly the most um, visible um, sign of the infection in humans. However, tuberculosis can also lead to systemic infections um, throughout the animal. Um, the range and severity of the disease in different hosts, though, can vary hugely. Um, and this is perhaps the, the, the most challenging aspect of bovine TB in that this variation makes it very difficult to actually understand what the true burden of the infection is and what the true economic costs of it might be. So we know that in cattle tuberculosis is linked to reductions in productivity in terms of um, the quality of the meat in the final animal or the production of milk. But most of this data comes from a number of very small studies in Germany in the 1950s, um, which, as you might expect, are not necessarily representative of the situation uh, nowadays or in countries around the world. There's a more fundamental challenge from this variation. Um, in the severity of the disease in terms of just understanding actually what the rates of transmission are of bovine TB. So for those of you that did the course with me, you should all remember that the first bit of information we need to understand what the transmission rate is of an infectious disease is some idea of the period of latency. So the time from infection to infectiousness and the amount of time that you are then infectious before you recover or are removed from the population. So as a chronic infection, removal essentially is death. So that places an upper limit on that. Um, but in terms of understanding the relationship between infection, infectiousness, and as we'll see, 
um, diagnostic status, that's much more challenging. And I think the best estimate I've seen, um, and certainly the most precise um, for the incubation period of tuberculosis is this from Percy Comstock. He was talking about human TB, but it equally well applies to TB in any animal. Uh, and he suggested that the incubation period ranges somewhere between a few weeks to a lifetime. And I think he's probably bang on the money there. Um, the problem is it, it does vary between individuals. There isn't the same rate of progression. And in fact, in human TB, um, we dichotomize the disease into what we call active tuberculosis, which is where you're sick and you're coughing and we assume you're infectious, um, and latent tuberculosis, which is basically the rest of us in that most of us have been exposed to tuberculosis, but may never um, experience symptoms or be infectious. Now in cattle, we have really less information on what exactly the spectrum of disease is, but there's no reason to think that it doesn't range in the same way. So why do we control bovine TB? So historically, the reason is that it is a zoonotic infection. So we are one of those warm blooded animals that can be infected with the tuberculosis complex. And we know that in countries like the UK, before they brought in um, uh, control measures uh, in cattle and pasteurization of milk actually critically, we probably killed an estimated few thousand kids every year from consuming contaminated raw milk products from cows. So that zoonotic risk is really difficult to quantify um, in other countries around the world that don't have controls. Um, it is likely to be low, but even in the situation where it's low, as we gain more and more, uh, as we get better and better control of tuberculosis in humans, that zoonotic risk will become a larger and larger proportion of the cases of TB that we see in humans. So zoonotic TB could become a much more important problem in the future. However, this is all a little bit anthropocentric and we need to remember that, as I said, tuberculosis complex can move freely between different hosts. So in high T human TB incidence areas, there is a significant risk of reverse zoonosis back into cattle. So this is a nice example um, where the route of transmission is uh, probably quite clear. I'd say. I mean, I'm not sure we proved it completely, but I think there's a strong argument to be made that for the small number of cases in Ethiopia where our colleagues found um, samples of human tuberculosis in cattle, it was linked to um, the practice shown in this photograph here. This is a herdsman who has been chewing um, the stimulant drug cat and he is spitting it into the cow's mouth in order to give the, the cow a little bit of a lift, a little bit of extra pep because this is an animal that's being used for draft power rather than dairy. So a clear risk of transmission there if the herdsman has TB. Um, the roots of transmission between hosts are not always so obvious, but there are also documented evidence of human tuberculosis infections in cattle around the world. So for those of you, if any of you actually have spent any time thinking about um, bovine tuberculosis, you might be surprised I've not said the words mycobacterium bovis yet. Mycobacterium bovis, which is down here in the bottom of this um, phylogenetic tree. So this is a phylogenetic tree of the mycobacterium tuberculosis complex. Most of this is taken up by the human tuberculosis uh, strains, uh, lineages one through seven up here in the top right hand corner. Okay, and this dominates um, our surveillance of mycobacterium tuberculosis. So this is not necessarily representative of the true diversity of the complex, but it's representative of what we typically sample. Mycobacterium bovis is typically the organism we associate with tuberculosis in cattle, and it's the primary organism that we see in the UK, in Europe, and in many countries around the world, including um, Africa, but it's by far from the only organism that can cause tuberculosis. In particular, there is uh, Mycobacterium capri, uh, Mycobacterium microti, and Mycobacterium origis, which we'll come back to um, in a few slides time, as it's particularly interesting. But it's important to remember that um, tuberculosis, bovine tuberculosis, is not just M. bovis, it is all the members of the tuberculosis complex.
So I started working on bovine TB in the UK and what typifies um, the epidemiology and distribution of disease in countries like the UK, um, which have uh, intensive surveillance system is that it is a managed infection. So how do we manage and control bovine TB? So the standard recommendation from the World Health Organization for Animals, WOA, is the use of screening of herds um, using the tuberculin skin test and then slaughtering out um, animals which are uh, believed to be infected until you clear the herd. Okay, so in the UK, we have a very intensive and um, statutory system of testing and slaughter, which starts with routine testing of herds, um, continuous inspection of carcasses, and then tracing back to affected herds to then be subjected to a sequence of what's called breakdown testing, essentially testing a herd until it uh, is clear from infection or it's clear from animals which test positive to TB. So the final and perhaps all of the challenges I've said are the, the greatest challenge, but that's because they all are. Um, the final challenge we have is that our diagnostic tests for bovine TB are very poor. Um, so the only test we have, the recommended standard, um, is uh, the tuberculin test. This is a very similar test to the test that is used in humans, so the MANTU test. You may be familiar with, with human TB, you may even have had it. The idea is you get a little um, vial of purified proteins taken from the mycobacterium um, complex. So essentially this is a live product where we culture bacteria, boil it up, and then we inject those proteins into under the skin of the host, and we wait a couple of days to see if there is a reaction. So it's measuring a delayed sensitivity reaction, an immunological response, which demonstrates exposure to uh, um, the mycobacterium organism. We can then measure the size of that reaction using these calipers, which are fairly um, imprecise and a much more difficult procedure to do on a, a, a cow than it is on a human, just due to the scale and danger involved in doing this. Um, another bigger problem is that even reaction what that reaction is telling us is that we've been exposed in some way. Um, the standard tuberculin test and catalyst thought to have a reasonable sensitivity, but poor specificity, particularly in countries where there's a high exposure of what are called environmental mycobacterium. So the UK is one of these countries and where we have a lot of avian mycobacterium. So we use a slightly different format of the standard test um, where we compare the reaction to bovine tuberculin. So from a from M. bovis to an avian tuberculins, which is taken from another non-bovine uh, TB, non-M. bovis um, strain. And then we use that to control the specificity of the test, reduce the number of false positives. The problem with that is that it has a reduction in the sensitivity of the test. So we gain in the specificity, but trade off in the sensitivity. And because we have no gold standard for actually saying this animal is sick or this animal is infectious with them bovis, it's very difficult to understand what those trade-offs are and what essentially we're managing. So in the UK, how I often describe it and present it is that we do not really control infection anymore. We control reaction to the skin test, whatever that means. And because we immediately kill animals as soon as they're test positive, we don't see how animals progress to infection. Um, so it becomes a much more mysterious um, disease than it does in unmanaged populations. So despite the limitations of this tool, this basic tool of tuberculin testing, some countries have done very well with this procedure of test and slaughter. So Australia in particular managed to successfully eliminate bovine TB through using a very aggressive test and slaughter program, very strict import controls helped by the fact that they're an island and some very um, uh, exciting uh, ways of um, culling and removing the infection from the wildlife reservoir to the extent of hunting down buffalo from helicopters and shooting them from helicopters. So very um, 
exciting stuff, huge amount of effort, huge cost, but they managed to eliminate the disease. Most countries struggle a bit more than that. And what they aim for is what's called officially TB free status. So they keep a low level of infection. Um, United States, Germany, most of Europe fall into this category. So they are, although they are officially TB free, they will occasionally see sporadic outbreaks and maybe spill over from wildlife populations. Um, but as long as they keep the incidence below a certain level, then they can maintain the trade benefits of being officially TB free. There's a final group of countries of which the UK is an important member, which are essentially struggling to even achieve TB free status, despite increasing amounts of testing and slaughter. This is often linked to the fact that they have significant wildlife reservoirs, which are not being tackled um, efficiently. Um, but there are more complicated things there in terms of how we test and slaughter. Um, nonetheless, there's a big motivation in these countries to stop using the old methods of test and slaughter um, and to look at alternatives, the most obvious of which would be the use of vaccination. That's not the topic of today's talk though, that's not the topic that we're talking about. What we want to think about is emerging markets, emerging dairy market markets in countries that currently have no controls for bovine TB. Now, part of the reason for this is that they just don't have a business case for doing it at the moment, because traditionally, if you look at extensively managed um, indigenous uh, cattle herds in these countries, um, the animal level prevalence is typically very, very low. Um, so as an example, India has the highest density of cattle in the world, 300 million cows and buffaloes. Um, if you look at indigenous cows, you only have a prevalence of at most 2%. So it's incredibly low, very poorly measured, but incredibly low. But if you look at the emerging dairy market where they are buying in um, exotic uh, breeds which have higher milk production, then you start to see a much higher level of bovine TB or an increasing level of bovine TB in those sectors because these animals are typically managed in larger herds and more intensive um, production facilities, but also are just more genetically susceptible to bovine TB. If you combine that with this drive towards a more Western diet, adding in more dairy products into the diet as an important source of protein, and the fact that the levels of pasteurization are not high, so 70% of milk thought to be unpasteurized, um, in India, there is potentially a risk that with emerging dairy markets, we'll see emerging bovine and in particular emerging zoonotic TB. Now, this is complete side note to this talk, but it's so fascinating, I think it's worth mentioning. Um, our work in India is very much at an earlier stage than the work that we've done in Ethiopia. Um, so I won't be talking about any of it specifically today, but really fascinating thing is that when our colleagues went out and looked to culture, um, tuberculosis from cattle, they found no mycobacterium bovis. And now that's surprising. If you're going to find anything in a cow, it's more like most likely to be um, bovis. All they found was mycobacterium origis. And it seems like the distribution of TB seems to, or TB in cattle in India seems to be a separate organism, a separate colonization event, um, which you might think sounds great, so maybe there isn't a zoonotic risk, but Origis is also found in humans. Um, so uh, this is a tree showing the very small number of isolates um, that we found um, from cattle clustering together with Origis samples from humans as well. So there may very well be a large burden of zoonotic TB in India, but not M. bovis, related organism M. Origis. Very interesting, very exciting. Um, but Topic of today, it's Ethiopia. 99% of the national herd is local zebu, small holdings with a very low animal prevalence of at most 4.1%. The, the prevalence in the dairy herds, so Holstein Frisian um, animals were introduced into Ethiopia in the late 70s, early 80s. 
and are confined mostly or concentrated around um, the Addis area, where the, the dairy belt around the, the, uh, the capital. Um, however, there is an expanding um, dairy industry moving out um, into the periphery. Much higher animal level prevalence, this is an average though, um, and as you'll see, some of the herd level prevalences are quite shocking. Okay, so most of the, the data that we have in unmanaged populations is limited to um, rather small scale prevalence surveys, typically at the herd level, occasionally um, wider scale, but very few, if in fact there are no estimates of what the transmission rates of bovine TB might be in these settings. So my job in ethical bots was to um, try and get a grip on what we think the plausible range of cattle to cattle transmission rates are within the Ethiopian dairy sector. Um, and this comes down to estimating, as you shouldn't be surprised, the basic reproduction ratio or R0 for bovine TB. Now, often when people um, are maybe in, in a case of having limited data, they will look to the literature to see what estimates might be in different contexts in different countries. That's not going to help you very much um, with bovine TB because there are very, very few estimates of R0 um, for bovine TB, and most of them are from me and from the UK. And they're based on using quite complicated within herd, between herd transmission models calibrated to the serial testing data that we have in the UK. So the methods that we use there are completely inappropriate um, to use in a non-managed population. There's another question which we need to keep bear in mind, which is that there's a default assumption with bovine TB that um, transmission scales with the size of the herd. So it's what we badly refer to as density dependence in epidemiological modeling. What it really is implying is that there's a herd size dependence. This observation and this dogma in the literature comes from um, the real observation that larger herds tend to have a higher prevalence and tend to have a higher risk of being affected by bovine TB. Um, but the reasons for that, certainly the reasons for that that we might see in the UK are very different than in an unmanaged uh, population, which has a much lower rate of uh, movements of animals between herds. So understanding whether or not there's a herd size dependence is incredibly important for control. Be in, in particular in emerging markets, because the implication is that as the market intensifies, control is going to get harder and harder. So there's a um, this if there is density dependence, it makes a more um, pressing case for immediate action rather than waiting before the problem is even worse. So what we hope to get from ethical bots was a little bit extra data than you would typically get um, from um, simple uh, surveys of prevalence. And in order to do that, we did two rounds of testing on herds from which we were hoping to be able to map the, how the uh, diagnostic status of animals changed between the two rounds of testing as a way to infer the rate of transmission. Unfortunately, the practicality of carrying out um, these types of studies in the conditions of the dairy industry in Ethiopia just it wasn't possible. Although we attached ear tags to all of the animals that we tested in the first round, most of those ear tags were lost by the time we went back to those herds. And it meant that we could only match between individuals in a very limited number of herds, very limited number of animals. However, what we did find was that in those um, herds that we did manage to monitor the change, there, there was no significant change in the prevalence of infection um, between the two rounds of testing. So a huge turnover in the animals and in terms of a loss of uh, infected animals, introduction of new animals, but no change in the average prevalence within each herd. And in fact, the distribution of prevalence is very much unchanged from um, surveys done as part of an earlier study 10 years earlier. So in order to progress, we had to make an assumption, and that assumption was that um, for our study herds, the level of infection that we're seeing is an endemic, at an endemic equilibrium. So the disease has been established for long enough that it's reached um, a constant level 
which reflects the rate of transmission within, within the individual hertz. Okay, that's a potentially problematic assumption, but it's the, the best assumption we can make given the data that we've managed to collect. So given that assumption, we can, in principle, estimate the reproduction ratio simply by looking at the within herd prevalence. Okay? The value of R0 will be inversely proportional to the prevalence in the herd at the equilibrium. So simply that the more animals infected, the higher the estimated R0. We can do a bit better, a lot better potentially than that, if we also have access to information on the age distribution of the reactor animals, the positive animals within the herds. Um, <clears throat> at the first instance, if we look at the, the ratio between the life expectancy in the herd and the mean age of first infection, that also gives us an estimate of R0. If we can, uh, we can then get even more information if we plot what the relationship between age and the proportion infected in the herd is. So remember, bovine tuberculosis is a chronic infection. So we expect animals to basically acquire positivity status. And then, uh, so the proportion infected in the herd should just increase over time up to a plateau where the rate of new infections is balanced by the loss of the animals due to just background mortality within the herd. So we would expect for a um, constant rate of transmission within the herd to see a curve that looks like this, which is referred to in the literature as the catalytic, catalytic curve or a catalytic model for historical reasons we don't need to worry about. Um, but basically we would expect to see this plateau up to a constant level of infection in the oldest animals. These are very standard methods. Um, which we can apply to the data that we collected from the field with two really important caveats. The first is that, as I said before, we don't really know which animals are infected. We only know which animals test positive to the skin test, to the tuberculin test. They have both imperfect sensitivity and specificity, and that means that in herds which have a high prevalence, we may be underestimating the true prevalence because of that poor specificity. And in herds with low prevalence, we may be overestimating that prevalence because of the imperfect specificity. So we need a way of dealing with that in our inference because that could really quite dramatically change our estimate of what the value of R0 is. Secondly, we also know that the reaction to tuberculin is dependent on the time from infection. So there will be a, a short period where animals are infected but don't react to tuberculin. We think that's small enough, we can neglect it. But if we read the textbooks on bovine TB, the dogma is that there is this state where animals are very heavily infected but become anergic, what's called anergic. So essentially test insensitive. So they're heavily infected, possibly very infectious, um, but will just not react to tuberculin. So we need to deal with that as well if we're going to estimate transmission. So for the first problem, um, we can rely on, we can pick a tool essentially off the shelf um, and use what is called um, a Bayesian latent class model. And these are used um, to estimate the performance of diagnostic tests when we have no gold standard. So perfect for TB. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with them, they may seem like magic. They seem like you're sort of getting a free lunch because what they do is they allow you to infer what the true prevalence of a disease is along with the sensitivity and specificity of the tests, even when you don't know the true values of any of those. Now, to understand how it works, if we think about what we measure is the test status, so we can either be positive or negative. Okay, But in principle, that test result is dependent on a hidden or latent variable based on the true status as to whether or not the animal is infected or infectious or not. Okay. So in principle, we can write down an equation which relates the probability of being test positive to the sensitivity of the test and the number of truly infected animals and the specificity of the test and the number of uninfected animals in the herd. Okay? So just because we write that down, that doesn't necessarily help us. 
But if we have more than two tests from two different populations, which have different prevalences, then in principle, we can triangulate those measurements to infer what the true values of the sensitivity and specificity of each test is and the true prevalence. So here, although we don't strictly have two tests, because we use the comparative version of the tuberculin test where we compare bovian and avian, we can use the comparative test and compare it to the single test. Okay. So nominally, we have two different tests there and 56 different herds with very different prevalencies. So it, this gives us a theoretical way at least to adjust for our imperfect sensitivity and specificity of the test to get a better estimate of the true prevalence. So in terms of the energy effect, so the time from infection effect, then we can also account for this relatively straightforwardly. If we just think about what effect it's going to have on our predicted age distribution of infection within the herd. Okay, So here again is a plot of age along the x-axis and the proportion of test positives on the y-axis. And the black line is what we would expect from the so-called catalytic model, where we have a constant rate of acquiring infection in the herd. Now, if animals become test insensitive as they get older, effectively, that means we would lose them um, from the herd. Okay? And we would expect to see missing reactors in the older animals. So to illustrate what that would look like, I've got this purple curve here where the curve, instead of just going up and plateauing, it turns over. Okay, So we see this gap between the expected number of infections based on the rate of transmission we see in young animals and what we see in older animals. Okay, So that missing proportion of infections could, in principle, be used to estimate what the duration of energy is. Okay, So that's conceptually what we do. Practically, we write down a compartmental model where instead of just susceptibles and infectives, we now have this third state A, which measures the energy. Okay? So in principle, we can have a way of measuring and accounting for this effect. There's a slight snag in that there's another alternative hypothesis which could equally explain any turnover in the age distribution. And that is if we see any excess mortality in infected cattle, which might make sense because they might be sick and they might be removed from farmers because they're less productive, then that also would lead to a similar change in the shape of the age curve. So that's what this pink curve looks like. So this is an example of an excess mortality curve. Okay, It again has a similar effect in terms of we see missing infectives that we would expect, but it has a slightly different shape. So again, potentially there's a way of distinguishing between these alternative hypotheses, and that's what we set out to do. So um, before we talk about the results and the set of models that we uh, fitted to, it's important to look at the data first and understand what it's telling us. So let's look on the right hand pane first. So this is the age of animals um, against the proportion percentage that were um, reactors, so positive to, in this case, the comparative skin test. The colours and the three curves relate to our three different data sets, so round one and two from Ethicobot's testing and the historic data set. And we see that if we're looking for suggestion of the curve turning over, there is a suggestion of that in the historic data set, which of course we use to develop the methodology. Um, before we actually collected the ethical bots data. Turns out from the ethical bots data that that signature is much less pronounced, which is interesting. Um, but overall, we see a similar um, increase in the proportion reactive with age with which we can fit the catalytic model. If we look on the left hand side, um, this is a plot of herd size now against the proportion of reactors positive within a herd. Okay. Again, the colours represent the three different data sets. And the main thing to notice here is that the variation within each data set is far, far greater than the variation between each data set. So this is suggestive that our assumption that we're at an endemic infection level in these herds is okay, but that there is a significant between herd variation going from 
10% up to almost 95% in terms of the apparent prevalence. Remember, this is just the apparent prevalence in terms of test positives, not necessarily infection level. The true prevalence could be higher. Critically, in terms of control and in terms of um, battling dogma, no evidence of density dependence at all. So the between herd variation here, much more important than any potential relationship with herd size. Okay, so we consider four different alternative models to estimate transmission rates. First, we just looked at the prevalence. So we estimated the prevalence using the Walter Huey model. We actually did a little better than this. We used something called the quasi-stationary distribution to get an exact um, likelihood, if anyone's interested. We'll talk about that at the end. Um, essentially, it's just a, a more sophisticated way of looking, of estimating the prevalence. Um, and we compared that estimate from the prevalence with um, the catalytic age structure model, the basic model with just a constant rate of acquiring infection, and then these two alternative models for turning over, the energy model and the mortality model. We had to deal with that huge amount of herd level variation because just averaging, looking at the population average, which is what we would do with human models when we look at the age distribution is clearly going to lead to problems here because of that herd variation and risk. So we include some herd level random effects to avoid um, biasing um, our estimate of the population average for the different models. As a side effect, as a free, free lunch, we get the sensitivity and specificity of the SIT and SICKET in Ethiopia as a side effect from putting all of these models into a Walter Huey latent class model. And we estimate them all using um, Bayesian framework, uh, estimated using STAN uses Hamiltonian MCMC. So first of all, this is just a very busy uh, slide that I want to spend far too little time talking about because it's not that interesting. This just illustrates that the different herd level estimates of R0 for the four different models, the energy, mortality, prevalence, and basic catalytic model, um, all show the same basic distribution in terms of the variation between herds. So there aren't any large discrepancies in terms of um, which herds are predicted to have a high um, R0 versus a low R0. So that's a great consistency check. Um, more uh, instructive to think about how the average um, of R0, the average level of transmission rates S inferred differs between the different mechanistic assumptions. So these are um, the posterior estimates. So the first thing we know is that the posteriors are quite wide and are all overlapping, but there's also a huge difference in terms of range of the upper and lower estimates. So the highest estimate of the average um, within herd R0 of bovine TB is just under two for the energy model. So that's the nice pale gray green color here, um, which is much, much bigger than the estimate we would get from just looking at the prevalence, which is barely above one. So that's the information we get from the age data is potentially taking us from a situation where we are predicting that we are pretty much close to elimination or very close to elimination to being very far away from elimination. So there's important information in the age structure that we would miss just looking at the prevalence alone. Okay. So in some ways, this might seem unhelpful. We've got such a wide range that's going from just below one to above two. How does this actually help us? So we can use model selection. So look at how well the models fit to make a sorting of how likely we think the different mechanisms are. I will say this, we should probably treat these with a little bit of skepticism because model selection tells us about the best models for a particular data set and sample of the data, they can be quite misleading um, in terms of what is actually going on. But they're a pointer to the hypotheses that we might want to go and test in further studies. So I use a, a method called approximate leave one out cross validation. Essentially, this measures the predictive density um, for each model uh, fitted to the same data. And the difference in the predictive density, the ELPD score, measures the difference in predictive accuracy. 
So if we do this for our catalytic models, then the model that is preferred is the energy model. However, the standard error in terms of the difference is comparable to the difference itself. So really there is not very much to choose between the energy and mortality models. They are both preferred above the model, which doesn't have that, but it's a very small effect. And if we think about what that energy model is actually saying biologically, then the estimated time to energy is actually much longer than the life expectancy of dairy cattle in Ethiopia. Okay, So this is reflecting the fact that energy is helping the model fit, but it's almost certainly not a large problem in Ethiopian herds, or rather the data is not suggesting it is a large problem in Ethiopian herds. Okay, so key takeaways though, are that the information on the age distribution substantially changes our estimates of R0. For the favored energy model, we get an estimate of two um, compared to about 1.2 from prevalence alone. However, there's only very weak evidence to choose between our alternative models here. And in fact, in a follow-up study in Ethical Bots 2, using multiple diagnostic tests, um, we found no evidence for energy. So when we specifically looked in at older animals, comparing them to younger animals, found absolutely no suggestion that there was a group of animals which were failing to react to um, the tuberculin test. So on balance, the mortality model is probably the, the most parsimonious explanation and probably the most reliable estimate of R0 that we have. Also critically, no evidence of density dependence between herds, but this extreme variation in estimated transmission rates between herds, um, which means that if we were to just use the average transmission rate, that would be very misleading for control. We really need to have a more nuanced approach because some me measures may work in some herds, but won't work in others, depending on the rate of transmission. There's also some fairly important open questions there of why exactly the rates of transmission seem to be so different in different herds, which if we could understand could also be a much more cost effective way of controlling disease, certainly than test and slaughter, which would just be completely unfeasible in Ethiopia because you'd essentially be depopulating so many of those herds. Um, but also maybe more beneficial than vaccination, which is a much more obvious um, control in terms of, or potentially more economic control for bringing in, in environments like Ethiopia. So I've spent a long time talking about this, but I just want to wrap up by saying a little bit about the prospects for the use of vaccination, in particular, why we don't just vaccinate cattle to prevent tuberculosis, because the human TB vaccine is derived, uh, BCG is derived from Mboba. So if anything, we might expect it to be more effective in cattle than in humans. It turns out that the evidence of the efficacy is variable. So limited efficacy, if you go to the literature, suggests it's maybe 60 to 80%, but they're not very specific on what that actually means. We'll come back to that in a second. And only a limited duration of immunity, maybe one to two years. So a need for revaccination on top of um, the initial vaccination. The main reason we don't use it though, is that it undermines the tuberculin test. So all current controls and the international standard of showing that you are free of TB and able to move TB internationally is that you pass the tuberculin test. And animals vaccinated with BCG will immediately become reactive to tuberculin. And even after a period of one to two years, about 20% of animals will remain reactive after being vaccinated, which means in order to use a vaccination and still be able to tr trade animals freely, both internationally and potentially within nations, you need a test which can differentiate infected from vaccinated animals. There were field trials of um, BCG in Europe back in the 1950s again. So much of bovine TB research was done in the 1950s and very little has changed, unfortunately. Um, this was a study where they, um, you will see uh, tried to clear a herd with 13 animals in it. And it took them about two years and they just about managed it with BCG. In that time, um, the prevalence of TB had basically 
was already well on the way to elimination through what was called the attestation program, which was essentially test and slaughter. Um, the origins of the current program, which started to fail for reasons we won't get into here. But the take home message here is that vaccination was never considered because test and slaughter was comparatively faster and more effective. That situation is very different in the UK now because we have been struggling with the costs for so long um, after the bounce back um, in terms of TB. How, and the long term goal of the UK government has been to move to vaccination um, rather than test and slaughter. However, the actual business case for that has never really been made. Um, and the last attempt that they made to design and carry out field trials was basically scuppered um, when this Conlon chap suggested that it wouldn't be economic unless they can get a replacement DIVA test with a very high target specificity. At the moment, we have trials ongoing with the aim to essentially show that the DIVA test has that high specificity and to achieve marketing authorization by 2025. However, still unclear to me what they're hoping to do with the vaccine, because as I said earlier, in the UK, we manage test positives. Um, and if we continue doing test and slaughter, but add in vaccination, there's the question of who is going to pay for it and who's going to benefit. Um, because farmers are not necessarily going to see productivity changes because we have very low prevalence anyway. Um, and their risk of having a TB problem might not change because they're still doing so much testing. So very unclear to me exactly what the UK's business case is and very concerned that they are going to authorise a vaccine which never gets used, um, which may taint the prospects of actually using it in countries which have a more rational and thought out need for using it. So I'd argue the business case is much more straightforward for countries like Ethiopia and particularly India, where cattle are sacred animals. So test and slaughter is just not an option. Um, and introducing the use of cattle vaccine, no matter the efficacy, um, can only produce benefits rather than the potential that it only increase costs, which is the issue that we have in the UK. Um, because, yeah, um, I'm going to, I was going to say a little bit about measuring efficacy of BCG, but actually I've run out of time. So I think I will stop there on that note that I think there is a huge prospect for um, uh, certainly benefiting animal health through the use of BCG to protect them against bovine TB and potentially reducing the zoonotic risk as well. Although that is a much harder case to make. Um, okay.